Oh, ladies and gentlemen, who have I got here? Oh, a new golden retriever. Her name is, not sure yet, but she's welcome to the voodoo room. This is her room. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Pete Camilleri. I'm from the Voodoo Room podcast. As you saw before, I had my golden retriever with me. However, she tends to wee a little bit and uh, I didn't want to get, you know, my jacket full of uh, urine. So I had to put her down, put her outside for a little bit, and then she's back in her pen sleeping away. Our next guest is the wonderful Nikki Bomber, who is a legend in his own right with the Melbourne Scar Orchestra. Uh, and more notably with um, John Butler Trio. Um, it was my pleasure, we met many years ago, um, probably about, uh, well, I think it was about 25 years ago that we met, but we knew each other when we were kids. Um, he was a bit older than me, but uh, I remember fondly about meeting him on one particular day. But uh, all that will be unraveled uh, in the podcast. And again, I want to thank all the subscribers and uh, the people who uh, watch. Um, as you can see from this uh, tally, uh, not subscribe is 84.4% and subscribe is 15.6%. It really means a lot to us at the Voodoo Room if you can hit the subscribe button. It doesn't cost you a thing. No admission fees, no union fees. It's just all for free. Um, you get to experience uh, some really uh, interesting people who come on to the podcast and they talk about uh, the trials and tribulations of their career with me. So um, if you haven't subscribed, we need to get that button clicked more often. We need the watch time more often. Dollar hot dogs, dollar popcorn. And don't forget, sit back and relax and enjoy the podcast. Ciao. Welcome, Nikki Bomber, to the Voodoo Room podcast. Hey. Good to have you on board, mate. It's been a while. We've been trying to get this up and together for a long time, and uh, we finally got there. Yeah, it's a good thing. Technology and, um, you know, um, schedules. Schedules. And lockdowns, lockdowns. and all that type of thing, but uh, it's great. And, yeah, yeah, thanks for inviting us. Okay, so um, you were born in Malta. A lot of people listening won't have heard of Maltese music before. Can you tell us a little bit about Maltese music and what it sounds like? Well, um, it's kind of two levels. There's the early traditional Maltese music, which you know, utilised, you know, a form of, form of like a, a bagpipe type of thing where they had the, the skin of a goat and um, kind of reeds, tambourines, uh, a little drum, they had a little drum, and it was a vocal tradition, more about vocal singing and, and telling stories. Um, but the, the classic folk music that, like, my father grew up with and I listened to as a child was um, this thing called Ana music. And, and it's, like, it's like kind of bad kind of Spanish country and Western, you know, with a, with a Mediterranean twist. Um, the guitars were tuned up. Um, there was always a lead guitarist kind of going, um, you know, you'd have a... And, and the singing was like they would scream at the top of their voices. And, and it, I'll give you an example, like... It's like, a, you know, bad country and western, right? Um, but, the, but, the, but the content of, the, of the, um, what they sang about was a little bit like, and that's, I don't know if it's an island thing, but it happens in Jamaica and it happens in Trinidad, where they kind of make fun of each other, right? And so, but because they're screaming, they can only last about three or four songs. So they have a queue of people at the side of the stage, and when the guy's voice is gone, another guy comes up and sings. And then by the time he, he comes around and he's saying, his voice has got back and he can sing more songs. But it was very much about things about your village and, and uh, you know, making fun. And I also saw that in Ethiopian music as well, where in a folk tradition, they make light of things. They, 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 um, they take the piss, you know. Um, so that is a classic um, kind of Maltese, you know, progression. And then there'd be, there'd be another guitar doing like on top of the, you know, you know. Singing 
melody, isn't it? Melody, yeah. Which is, you can hear there's elements in Spain. When I was travelling in Spain, there was a song that I was going, that's a Maltese song. It was... Um, uh, mm, um, uh, 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 That's an old Maltese traditional song. I actually recorded it with my dad. And when I heard it in Spain, I went, how is that? But when you think about it, the Mediterranean, Malta being influenced by so many cultures, that obviously the, the music's going to be influenced as well. So traditional Maltese music for me is 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 kind of that, you know. Yeah. So your your um, father was a musician? Well, it, my father was, um, both my per- parents were on the stage. Mum used to be, the, the, the most famous magician in Malta was my grandfather. His name was um, Chris Van Byrne. He had a, he, had a, um, um, he was, had lots, lots of allocades. And mum used to be his assistant. So that was her side of the story was, was um, just being on stage and, you know, just knowing that world. And dad used to do a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan plays. Um, and so he was on the stage and he would, you know, have to sing parts and um, and he knew a lot of the Maltese songs. He was, he was loved getting people together and playing. He wasn't the best, you know, vocalist or, or you know, prolific, I mean, a, a proficient musician, but he just loved the spirit of it. It was very much like, you could say he was quite a folk, a folk musician. Uh, and he played the harmonica a lot and he used to play backwards too, like upside down. Um, and... I was lucky enough to do a recording with my father. He passed away last year. And I did, I did, when he was 70, I did a recording with him capturing all the songs that we used to play live. And I got him to speak about his childhood. And then he played a couple of songs on on, um, on the harmonica. And I was at Mum's the other day and it's like he's there, you know, because you can hear his voice, you can hear his, he, he laughs and, you know, and he jokes. And so it, it, it's a really beautiful thing to do if you get the opportunity to record you know, your, your father or someone, you know, a loved one that's older, you know, the record has helped and brought joy and closure, if you like, to a lot of um, the, his life, you know. It's like it was a real kind of testament. So it was a great thing to do. I'm glad I did it. Yeah, totally. That sounds like a beautiful thing. Um, it's on two- Spotify. Okay. Well, yeah. ch- check it out, <laughs> folks. Um, in 2003, you founded the Melbourne Scar Orchestra, which at last count has 34 musicians in it. What's it like hiring 34 musicians? <laughs> it's, it's the firing is the hard part. No, um, with, there's actually more. There's, there's, there's about 45 on the books, right? But um, depending on what gigs we have to do, if we have to go interstate, we kind of bring it down to about 23, 24 because of flights and everything. But if we're in Melbourne, easily 32, 33, not a problem. Um, Look, it, it's such an, an amazing band because everybody's in it because they, it's not a financial. How could, how could 35 people in the band be financial, you know? Um, so there's a lot of love there, love for the music and love for what we do and how something that's unique and ridiculous would have any type of success. But, you know, I've had more, I've won more ARI awards and everything than with that band than with anything else I've done before. So it was unlikely, but because of that, it's all about in my belief of like the chemistry. Some things are just when they come together, they work. And and what the orchestra brings is a sense of like danger, madness, mayhem, joy, and um, and energy, kind of like celebrating energies, kind of you know positive energy, positive force. And um, so everyone in the band gets that and gets that when we go on stage. It's about everybody being on the same team, on the same page, and when you've when you've got that many musicians putting that energy out to an audience, it comes back. It's it's really it's, it creates this kind of electronic loop where you kind of feed off each other. It's, and it's a you know I, I turn around sometimes and go, well, it's pretty it's pretty incredible, and I don't get to see a lot of the the the, the antics. So when I see videos and I see what they're doing behind me, I get to see what the audience sees. And so it's a, a, there's, a, there's a good, real big appreciation for the love of that. It wouldn't exist otherwise, you know. It, it, it's, um, so there's never really any firing. There's just more hiring 
and working out after we had, there's a bit of a roster system with the horns. You know, everyone doesn't get a gig, same with the drummers. But um, thankfully, I'm always there, which is great. <laughs> But uh, I mean, I've, I've I've worked with you twice in that in a live situation, um, and I remember the first time, which was um, the world. What was it? The World Trade, the World or, or, Army, Army, uh, Australian, yeah, Australian World, world Music, Music Expo. Expo. Yeah, that's right. And I think you guys came on before. Oh, what was his name? The African singer. Uh, Arturi or whatever. Anyway, there was an African singer before. You, or were you headlining on the Sunday? Was it? Or was it Femi Cootie or something? Yeah, Femi Cootie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, one of the Cootie brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. And um, uh, and I was we on, were on before him. Yeah, right. that's right. And I was um, on side of stage, and I just I was near your guitar player. I can't remember his name, but I just I just kept all I could hear was his amp, and I just thought, man, this guy's a killer guitar player. He's terrific, you know, and. Um, but just the energy on side of stage, you could sense it, and uh, and 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 also how it uh, expelled that into the audience, and you just saw the audience uh, participation was um, was incredible. Like I haven't seen anything like that for a long time. But the second time I saw you, which was a different experience again, which was I was doing front of house for the um, the Gippsland uh, Summer of Soul. Um, yeah, you remember that yeah, one? Envelope. Envelope. Yeah. And um, again, that was a different experience because of the way the the, the out the outlay. It's not an indoor concert; it's an outdoor no, concert. It's so, so, park, so yeah. it's a different energy you get from that. Um, and they were two very vastly different experiences for me. You know, just watching you and and how you bring the audiences in um, from one place being an indoor venue to an outdoor venue. They're very different animals to deal with. You know. Yeah, well, the, one of the main things in any of my performances, but especially with the orchestra, is the connection with the audience. Because I think the the perform the um, the art of being on stage and saying I'm a musician, I'm going to be on stage and I'm going to give you something. It's an ancient ritual. It's an ancient ritual, and there's also the audience is a big part of that ritual. Is that they choose not to be on stage. They choose to experience this, and and it, it's a it's a sense of unity that happens. And music is amazing because it's universal. You know, we've played all around the world. You just know the people kind of intrinsically feel something. They can sense joy. Music can can you know it's dynamic. You can have it up, and bring it down. You so it's really important. Number one to take people on the journey, and not have a monodynamic. Uh, is to get personal with them, you know, just like it's like, hey, you know, you can do this. You can turn around and do that and ex- do something physical. It doesn't just have to be a a, a visual experience and, a, you know, and get your bodies moving, you know. Um, and when they see the irreverence on stage, it's like these guys, these guys are crazy. These guys, this is like, this is like ridiculous, you know, what's going on. It's joyous. And when you get joy, you get endorphins. And when you get endorphins and people sing together and sing together, you're capturing something ancient. And I'm, I'm always been aware of that. And sometimes to my detriment, like I'll do a certain song that'll be a cover song and there'll be something that will work for that moment. And they'll go, why didn't we play this song? Why don't you know? like, I get on stage and say, look, I, I because it's all about that, that energy that happens there, you know, you can you can kind of disappear, you know, um, up your uh, up your proverbial quite easily, you know. So I'm aware that there has to be a combination of all, a nice balance of all those things. But the connection with the audience for me is like it's number one. Doesn't matter where we are, and doesn't matter how many people too. I just did a solo gig recently, and you know, it was a COVID situation, and just before, you know some lockdown hit and so ended up being just a spattering of people. But I had to treat it as though it was a thousand people. You know, I still had to do the same performance. I still had to do the same, you know. So it's it's easier with the orchestra because when you've got that many people, people you kind of like, it's like having a, a um, you know, 35 horsepower engine that's kind of pushing you along. And, and people appreciate that you've gone to that effort to dress up, get on stage, do this for them for an hour 
you know, it's, it, there's a lot of kind of positive things that go with it that, that kind of work, you know. But audience participation, number one for me, yeah. Um, do you learn more from working in a band of 34 musicians than you do from working in a trio? What is your favourite thing and your least favourite thing about working in both types of bands? Well, well I, I do solo stuff now too. So I, I do everything from a solo to 34 people on stage. Um, they're, all, they're all different beasts and they're all, I, I learn from all of those. Um, the orchestra, what I've learned from that is a sense of that I'm the captain of that ship and I have to be a good captain. I have to be generous, but 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 strong. Um, you know, I I'm, I I, don't, I never liked a hard-handed approach. So I always, you know, kind of respect everyone's ability to play and their their all the work they've done to to learn their instrument. So um, and what I've learned from the orchestra is that there are so many good musicians that you can't be a control freak in that area. You have to actually accommodate the brain trust that exists in an orchestra, right? So, so the orchestra is very much like that. It's like, look, I'll, I'll be the captain and I'll organise all this stuff and, and um, you know, I'll, I'll get set up, set up a team so this can work. But at the end of the day, when we're writing and when we're rehearsing and everything, it's everyone's opinion counts. And it's hard to kind of do that in a... Um, uh, you know, in a, in a um, comfortable manner, but I think I've learned how to do that. So that was the biggest thing I learned from the orchestra, that, you know, you you it's it's team mentality, family mentality. And as it gets kind of further down, it's about um, down to the solo. Now, solo is probably one of the hardest things because it's you. You're like a shag on a rock and an audience. But it's also incre- more powerful than I ever thought it was because when you start doing solo after having a big band, you think you have to play louder to kind of go, but you realise actually it's the other way. You have to kind of go back and actually the more intimate you are, it's a bit like it's a slingshot, the more back you go, the more momentum you have to, you know. Um, So that's been the hardest thing. Um, And I I play in many different configurations because of budget. Sometimes they can't afford, like buttons. So I I have solo. I have a little trio situation. I have Bustamento, which is a six or seven piece, and then I've got the orchestra. So Bustamento I, does all the gigs that they can't afford the orchestra, but there's enough of a budget to bring six people. And then the thing below that is a version of Nicky Bomber with all the songs down to the solo. Now, I've just released a solo album, my second one, and um, that's a whole new kettle of fish. I was going to actually do it completely solo, like using loops, and that type of thing, but I, and I started getting together, but I, I felt I was really constricted by not so much the groove, but the if I wanted to have all the changes in the song, I would have to play the song from where to go, and I didn't get my, I haven't got my technology together yet. I bought a new one of these new samplers, you know, that one there, you know, you know, so I can start. You can put stuff into that, you know. Twenty one pilots use it live. Um, so I've, I've got to learn how to use that. But So up until then, I put a little band together with my brother and, and having a band and with me on the drum kit, so it's a whole new experience, it's like it's so much looser and so much more what I'm used to because I, I want to go off on a tangent. I want to stop a song, a mid-song, and do something or do a little solo or I like to have that freedom. It wasn't financial. You know, some gigs were great, some gigs weren't because of the COVID thing, some we had to cancel. And so at this particular point of my career with the solo thing, I, I, I um, it's not consistent enough to keep three or four people on the road, you know. So I have to look at it when I tour again that maybe two or less do some things that are more guaranteed. Um, so, you know, you, you, you learn how to run a business, but you learn how... You know, playing drums out the front was a whole new kettle of bag, kettle of fish, bag of fish, bag of chips, bag of whatever chips. you want. <laughs> um, uh, and so, but it was challenging because I had to maintain the enthusiasm of the audience from behind a kit. 
And I got it towards like three, three or four gigs in. I was like, yeah, I'm comfortable now, you know. That's oh, good. Yeah, I mean, because you're a multi instrumentalist, you know, you play Maltese drums. instrumentalist. Maltese instrumentalist, that's <laughs> right. So, you, I mean, you play drums, you play conga, you play um, guitars, you play, uh, you, you sing. Um, yes. What else do you do? Do you play? Well, I mean, I mean, on the new album, I play everything. everything. I play drums, keyboards, bass, guitar. Um, I have this new instrument, it's kind of like a violin, Masenko thing. Um uh, I've got, you know, I mean, percussion is, is if you're a drummer, you can kind of do percussion if you learn the, the proper techniques. Um, and, and that was kind of a mission for me to actually um, learn how to play these instruments properly mm. so it does sound like a good band, you know, like, yeah. uh, and that's the whole idea. I can't play any horn instruments though, unlike, unlike your brother. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He can do all that plus the horns, I guess, but um, <laughs> that's another kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, really interesting because, uh, you know, some people would only imagine you, I guess, as a as a leader of the Melbourne Scar Orchestra mm-hmm. um, and they probably don't get that sort of um, broader view of yourself, you know. Um, but I know you I, I, because we grew up in the same suburb, so I remember um, I was going to bring this up earlier, but I remember when I was about 10 years old and I read an article in the local um was paper. It? The, what was it? The advert? What was the local paper? Yeah, the Western the Times, Western Times. And, the, and the Mail. The and Mail. The it was the Mail. It like. was the Mail, and um, and it had the the major minor. Was that that was your band, right? Yeah, yeah, that was my. That was playing bass in that band. That was the first band to play bass. In. Yeah, right. And there was a picture of you. There was it was a trio, wasn't it? That, yes, that, right. Yeah. yeah. And I remember you all were wearing black, and you looked amazing. Military kind of vibe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on this whole military trip of, like, wanting to save the world with the Peace Army. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, but that was that the uh, catalyst of uh, your career, that band? No, well, no, way before then. I've been playing drums since I was six years old. So I, I, we, 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 I nestled into the family dance band. So for many, for up and, from the age of six till 14, we used to play every weekend for Maltese dances, for balls, for weddings, engagements. We, we had a number one hit with a singing priest in Malta. Uh, we went to the studio. We, you know, we, we, um, we, toured, we toured that that album. We went to, we played um, Sydney and Adelaide. Um, and it was the first time I ever went, went on a plane when I was about 13 years old for music, you know, it was great. But then, um, then when I was, then when, when I was about 14 and 15, we started getting into we, we formed our own cover band playing songs that we liked in Top 40. And that band enabled me to cut my teeth and start touring. And by 16 I was professional and I wrote my first song when I was on tour and I realised I loved writing and I loved, you know, the whole original thing. Uh, so when you say touring, where, where were you touring? Well, at the time there was a circuit as a cover band. You could do, you could you go to a place like the, Grove in a hotel in Rockhampton, and you spent six weeks there. You played five nights a week. It was a bit like the Beatles doing ham, the Hamburg thing, you know. And then we went to Cairns, and then we went to Newcastle, and then we went to, um, and then and then we played all around Melbourne. There was venues that would have a band would play, then a disco would come on. The band would play, and a disco would come on. You know, and it was it was a circuit, and there was an agent that booked those circuits, and we played top forty and some reggae and everything, and I realised I really loved reggae. And then then that morphed into an original band. I was still playing drums. Um, and then, then I kind of gave it away a little bit because I just got really frustrated with our ambition and everything. Was that, and then, was that a and band called Fugitive Flight? That was called Fugitive Flight, yeah, exactly. And Fugitive Flight became Guided Tour. And then I, I kind of stopped it um, and then I got asked to join Relax with Max and I learned and I had to learn all the James Brown songs. And that turned my, that changed my life a bit. You know, like it was like, wow, this funk is amazing. And so I got back on the drum kit. Um, and then I started an original band and from there it went to Major Minor, which was like a trio and I played bass. Um, and then then I was always just an original band. So it just kept on and then I did sessions. I met Joe around that time. Uh, I did a band called The Truth. Um, and The Truth became, got signed to Mushroom Records. 
we had a lot of turntable hits. We couldn't sell a record. We couldn't actually sell any records or CDs, but but we would play live. We supported Brian Adams, Hunters and Collectors, Roachford. We toured all around Australia, but couldn't. It, it never translated. People never never actually bought our CDs. It was just a, they were like turntable hits, and and they, even our gigs. They weren't. We couldn't really never never really cost that that push the threshold of what happens when a, a song becomes a hit or something. There's a point where you can stay below that that line and something happens. The Bad, Bad Loves had it with Green Limousine and put them over the line. Cat Empire had it, you know. And so it, it, you, all these bands have these kind of, we never got that, you know. And I suppose I've always been looking for that, you know. It's always a thing, like even with any time I write a song, you think, oh, hopefully it'll become a hit, it'll get played on the radio, that will put you into a new level. Um, and I've never, I've, the only band I've really been associated that's got that's, that's had that has been the John Butler Trio and Melbourne Sky Orchestra. But all the other bands were still great bands live. So we were always, so I lived off playing live and, and having as many bands as I could. So it was Banana Oil, Bomber, you know, The Truth. Um, you know, major minor, the solo stuff. And then I learned how to use a studio because I realised in 1988 I got a publishing contract for my songs and I bought a studio And, and um, because every time I used to go into a studio, the engineer wouldn't turn up, it cost too much, I couldn't get the money, and I went, I just can learn how to do this by myself. And I bought an eight-track and a, a mixing desk similar to the Lee Perry one, the Black Ark one, and, and started and kind of haven't looked back since. And now I've got a Neve console. It's great. Yeah. Well, it helps when you know how to play an instrument, doesn't it, with, with that recording? Well, that was the thing, yeah, just being able to kind of mess around and play and, you know, put a drum track down and, and yeah, learn how to play mics and stuff. Because we, we worked together on when you first came to Woodstock. Um, That's right. You were playing with. Who were you playing with back then? <laughs> um, Double Dub? Double Dub, that's it, yeah. That's right, yeah. Because yeah, I yeah. remember that song you wrote about your cat. Yeah, Scarlet Girl. Scarlet Girl, yeah, great song. Scarlet Girl, <laughs> claims into our lives. Yeah. That's a beautiful song, actually. It yeah. is. Yeah, I remember you, you You had an old cat and it died and you wrote that song I about did. Yeah, yeah. it. I did, yeah, she did. She did, but, but she, she, had, she was like the equivalent of being 21 when she died of, of in cat years to human years, but she was amazing. She just used to, you know... She'd, she'd walk out and she'd be on top of the chimney looking down and then she'd be, you know, scurrying up left, right and centre. She just had this kind of like, like she probably, she, like she only knew that she only had, you know, a short life to live and she, and she lived she made the mo- yeah. yeah, she made the most of it. Yeah. So um, every time you've been a member of the John, John Butler trio are there, uh, um, and there have been two, they've released what many would consider to be a signature album of theirs. So clearly you being in the band has a massive impact. What do you bring to the band, whether it be a trio or a 30-musician situation and perhaps more? What don't you bring to a band? (laughs) What don't I bring? I mean, you know, we'll talk about John Butler first and there were specific times when I rejoined the band and had a different influence each time. The first time... I was playing in double dub when John saw me for the first time, but and he was he was going out with my sister, so um, you know, family vibe. Um, and he was getting into reggae. He was really loving reggae and the whole kind of the the Jimi Hendrix kind of trio looseness, and also um, when Jimi Hendrix got the other drummer, like it was Lenny, uh, someone Lenny or someone Bruce or something. Um, I've forgotten who the drummer was, and John really liked that version of, of Hendrix. Um, he was getting into Bob Marley and getting into the whole kind of Led Zeppelin kind of, um, you know, those bands that had some kind of um, chemistry that kind of happened, you know. So we said when it came to the reggae thing, he kind of just wanted to blow everything out of the water and restart again. Um, so he asked me to play drums and I, I toured with him just as a, just John and I, like the Black Keys type of thing. And then when I came back to Australia, I did this one gig um, with a band called Descarga, a Latin band. We did one gig, but we had a rehearsal. But the bass player from that rehearsal played double bass and he was, like, really good. 
And I said, look, I'm, I've just joined John Butler and we're looking for a bass player. And Shannon Birchall joined and we ended up doing the first album together, which was Sunrise Overseas. And, and how Zebra came about, for example, which is the hit single, um, was a combination of everything we were trying to do. It was Led Zeppelin meets raga, meets reggae. So, and the song was called Ze Zepra because I wrote down Z-E-P for Zeppelin and raga for reggae. And, uh, and it was like, oh, this is the song that I call Zepra, right? Because we didn't have a working title. And then, then I said, oh, do you know the joke about, you know, the zebra, is it a black horse with white stripes or is it a white horse with black stripes? You know, and so that kind of informed what the song was about. I could be hot, I could be cold, I could be black, I could be white, you know. Um, so, and that was a classic thing of like that's that was really the the um, the pivotal peak song of what we we're trying to do. Reggae in the verses, rock it out in the choruses, you know, which is very much a police thing. But because he's got the sly guitar and that type of thing, that's it's a different different. You know, different time, different vocalists. It was different enough to to um, be its own unique thing. So that's kind of what. And but I didn't tour with that album. So I've because I had Bomber going at the time. So we just did that album, and I got a Michael Barker to join the band. So Michael Barker and they they toured that album, but I was in. I I, I helped do the album. I was and, and, and I suppose pivotal in, in making helping to make that sound. Then. The next time I joined John was when we did April Uprising. And again, same type of thing. He just wanted to kind of um, blow things out of the water a bit and and just kind of reinvent himself. And so we had a jam and it felt good again. And then we found another bass player and we auditioned a couple of bass players. And um, and that was the, the second time we came together and we recorded two albums. We recorded April Uprising and Flesh and Blood. And at the end of Flesh and Blood, and I, and I toured April Uprising with him, and we, 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 I did five years worth of touring. And then Flesh and Blood, Melbourne Sky Orchestra was starting to really get some, we were selling out, you know, venues and everything, and, and, and he came to one of the gigs and he said, look, you know, I understand where you are at the moment, but, you know, if you need to move on, you know, if you know that type of thing, you know, now's probably a good time to do it. You know, because it's something strike while the eye is hot, and that's you know, and so I did. You know, and and I always had the thing with John was that I was always in his band, and it wasn't a thing of like, even though I felt you know like part of the family and everything, I felt like my boat was sitting over there, ready to go with lots of songs, but I was on this boat helping this guy out. You know, and so at some point I had to get back to my boat. You know, so and I did. And so when now you can say I went back to the orchestra and what I brought to the orchestra was a sense of organisation, a sense of that you need a captain, a band that size need, need, needs a captain. I don't always get it right, but I had a vision. We got a recording contract. We, we've recorded seven albums since. Um, and you have to have someone to coordinate that. You have to have someone to coordinate the team, the artwork. The, the recording, the engineer, the songs, the rehearsals, the um, uh, the production, the um, when it was going to roll out, conversations with the record label, conversations with management, and everything. So I was kind of the pivotal person of that, you know, and um, and I think everyone respects that because I understand the concept of what the, the band's about probably the most, you know. So that's kind of what I brought to those bands. What I didn't bring, I don't know how to answer that question. I suppose what I, um, I think what I brought and realising why I had to make my own solo album is that every album has, the, every band and every chemistry has got their own entity and sometimes it's not about, you're also going to have your colour always, but it's not about saying what, and you've got to kind of say what's best for this band and it may not necessarily be, a song that you think you think is going to work because you like it as a song. It may, it may not work in the orchestra context. So you have to be um, so it's a bit careful, I suppose, when you, with the orchestra is what songs I don't bring because it's important to get other people's um, input. And I'm, I'm, you know, when we did the 52 songs, 
we did a, you know a song a week for a whole year. I, I relied on that, you know, and and uh, fantastic ideas came. Guys gave me stuff on a little MIDI keyboard. They'd write an idea on the back of a napkin or something. And any, anything was anything was valid. And sometimes, you know, you, you hear something that just sounds like it's you know out of a transistor radio. But if you can hear the song, you can hear the song. And there's one song called Sly Boots, and another song called Generations Gone. Which, when I when you, if you hear the original, it sounds like a Casio keyboard. That's um, a little demo song on a Casio keyboard. But if you listen closely to what he's done, good key changes and everything, it's like fuck. This is actually a really well written tune. And so you have to extract it and bring it out and make it an orchestra thing, you know. So, um, so I suppose what I didn't bring is too much of, of the, the Nicky Bomber personal kind of colour and realise that I just leave that for my solo album. Family is something that seems to be ever-present in the way you make music. However, I know there are a lot of people listening who are happy to see their family at Christmas and that's enough until next Christmas. So this might be an obvious question, but why have you and why do you continue to choose to make music with your family? Um, well, the main person I usually work with is with my brother, Michael. Um, I have made music with my sister, Danielle, and everything. But um, there is, when I'm playing drums and in the band called The Truth, for example, where I was on the drums and my brother was on keyboard bass and keyboards, we had a synergy that only brothers could have. Um, and it was always strong. Um, so any chance I get to, to, to be able to use Michael, you know, in the orchestra playing keyboards and that type of thing, um, it's just, you know, as well too. Um, and it's a familiarity. Sometimes it actually creates problems, you know, because it's a, it's a, um, it's too familiar, you know what I mean? And you can't, if you, if I'm telling my older brother, hey, don't do this and don't do that, there is a, an energy there that's kind of saying, you know, what are you doing telling me I'm older than you? You know what I mean? So, but again, you just try to take it out of the context of of, of the family thing and just treat it like a you know, respectful musician, treat him like a respectful musician. Um, but, you know, I've grown up in the family atmosphere. My mum was from a family of 14. Dad was a family of 11. We had six kids. And even when I, I, when I talk about the orchestra, I actually, I consider it a family. It's like so... And I think it's that sense of like we're making music, we're doing this, you know. We, we, this is this is our craft, but we want to be friends as well, you know. You want to create that sense of unity that I can I can kind of say something and you and you don't take it personally. Or if it gets heated up, you know, five minutes later you can be going, okay, that was cool, you know, the kind of the family vibes. Um, so that's important for me. And, and also that I'm, I'm getting older and so is he with Michael. And I think, you know, when, when, when as you do get older, you kind of, your, your values about friendship and who you want to spend your time with and um, if there's an opportunity to make music with someone that you've known for so long, then you do it. it you know, it, Michael doesn't always fit the bands that I'm working in. And, you know, he wasn't a huge fan of reggae and ska, but once he kind of got the vibe and everything, he was like, yeah, but he's a funk meister, you know. And that's why with the original band that I'm doing now, the solo band, there's a lot of funk on the new record. So he's the obvious choice anyway. Was he in, um, he was playing with you as a very, like when you were touring as a young boy, right, when you were in teenage Well, we started, well, this is how it all started with, Michael started on the drum kit when I was five years old. And then, and then he moved on to the piano and the drum kit was left open. So, you know, before school or when I started school, I should start hitting it. And I have no idea how, but I, I knew rhythms. I could hold a rhythm and, and I was in the band by the time I was six years old. And I, I didn't, didn't know. I didn't know that I was playing a drum groove. I just heard it and went, yeah, it goes like this. So I must, there must be something in the DNA, you know, because I only had my first lesson when I was 13 years old and I was told I was playing wrong. 
I was saying, you, your, your technique's all wrong. You need to change your technique. You know, so, who, who taught you? I went to Billy Hyers, went to a guy called Peter Blick. In Footscray, right? Howard Reaper. But I was lucky enough that when we were, I went to a Catholic, Catholic school, Sacred Heart School in, in Newport, and every Monday morning we used to have assembly and there used to be a marching band. And I got to join the marching band at six years old. And so I learned all the drum rhythms. Um, and we used to march around the school every Monday morning and then sing Don, God Save the Queen. And we learned marching rhythms from a guy called George Watson. He used to come to the school every Wednesday and teach us. And that's where I got my first, like, rudimentary lesson was from him. Wow. That's, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it, the uh, trajectory of someone who uh, picks up an instrument and how they go about it. I, I, I still, still can't fathom it. I mean, you see kids on, on, on YouTube now or, you know, like they're too young to know that. There must be something, you know, that's just intrinsically in them, you know. Well, that's all I've got for you today, buddy. That's all <laughs> my five questions. Um, <laughs> oh, good man. <laughs> All right. Well, um, great talking to you, buddy. And, you too, uh, thanks, for your, thanks for your time, and uh, it's always good to see you, Nicky. Yeah, man, you too. <laughs> All right, mate. Good thank, idea. Thank you. All right, take it easy. Yes, you too. See you, Pete. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Voodoo strikes. It'll tear apart your head when voodoo strikes. You wish that you were dead when voodoo